stop, drop, and pass the rolls. We are a month away from Turkey Day, one of the best holidays of the year. Kids, I've got one for you, and you're gonna wanna share this one with Uncle Jimmy at Thanksgiving dinner. Ready? What instrument does a turkey play? The drumsticks. For us at Kensington, Thanksgiving marks a yearly tradition of delivering Thanksgiving baskets to families in our school partners community. It's our 26th year, can you believe it? Moving out together as a community to provide thousands of Thanksgiving meals. Not to date myself, but it's been around longer than I've been alive. Really? Wow. Of course, we are mixing things up this year to ensure the health and safety of volunteers and the families receiving the baskets. Instead of the traditional turkey and all the fixings, we are providing non-perishable items along with a gift card to Meyer, which allows families to purchase and cook a traditional Thanksgiving meal without the added stress of the cost. There are still two ways you can participate. You can donate to Fun Baskets, which are $50 each, and you can sign up to deliver a basket on Saturday, November 21st. The delivery process will look a little different with COVID-19 protocols, but we will still have the opportunity to talk to the families who are receiving this special gift. It's not always about the meal, it's about the conversations and relationships that happen because of it. Go to kensingtonchurch.org slash thanksgiving to be a part of this tradition. Now, I'm handing off to Craig McGlashan to give us a scoop on our new series. So one of the most incredible stories in the Bible is also one of the most important stories to the unfolding promises of God. It's a story that frankly gets more paper real estate than any other story in the Bible. It covers several pages and chapters in multiple years. It's a story of a man named Joseph. Starting in November and then every week through the month of November, we're gonna be covering a variety of moments in Joseph's life where Joseph encountered things that while they're different than what we encounter, the end result is the same. Moments where it feels like life just delivers a punch out of nowhere. And what Joseph teaches us throughout his life is that his ability to withstand whatever punch came at him and hit him in the face was that he believed in the strength and the power of something stronger than any hit. And it's what he concludes with near the end of his life when he says, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. So join us starting November 1st and throughout the entire month of November as we look at the life of Joseph and how to take a hit. You guys are awfully noisy back there. Come on, Craig. Okay, I will. Please pray for me. I hope everything worked out okay for you, Craig, but my money is on the other guy. No offense. So, a Technicolor dream coat, MMA fighting, and Kensington. Sounds like some pretty interesting ingredients for an awesome series. Today, we are wrapping up on our series, United, looking at one of the most well-known stories from the Bible. It's about having a desire to love others and risking our own lives to help a complete stranger. I'll let you guess what story it is. Thank you for joining us, and now let's open our mind and hearts for what God has for us today. Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? All right, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on site. And for those of you joining us online, we're so glad to have you guys here. I'd love to invite you guys to stand up. We're gonna start the day singing a song called This I Believe. Um, and as if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know we've been saying these really powerful foundational statements about our faith in Jesus. And this song, the words are the exact same. We get to sing together these beautiful statements about what we believe about Jesus. I 
judge and our defender. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe, I believe in you. And I believe you rose again. And I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sing that again. I believe. And I believe in you. And I believe you rose again. And I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sing, I believe in God our Father. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three.
We believe. 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 We believe there is only one God who exists eternally as a trinity of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each member of the Trinity is fully God, yet each is personally distinct from the other. We believe the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, is the Word of God, written by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down exactly what God wanted to communicate to humankind. It is authoritative, trustworthy, and unchanging. We believe men and women are created in the image of God to live in relationship with God. Yet, the first two humans, Adam and Eve, chose to rebel against God, bringing sin into the world. Because of their actions, sin spread to all humankind, creating separations between humanity and God. We believe Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was the long-awaited Messiah of the Jewish people, and the Savior of the world. He was both fully God and fully human. He came to redeem all of humanity from the power of sin and death. We believe Jesus Christ was crucified and died on a cross, was resurrected from the dead, ascended to heaven, and someday we return to earth to fulfill God's eternal plan. We believe Jesus Christ's death on the cross paid for all sins. It is only through faith in Jesus Christ, not by being a good person or doing good deeds, that a person can be restored to a right relationship with God. We believe the Holy Spirit comes to live within a person once they have placed their faith and hope in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. The Spirit gives followers of Jesus the power to live as God desires them to live and gives spiritual gifts to serve the church and change the world. We believe the church, both local and universal, is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. In obedience to scripture, the church organizes under qualified leadership, gathers regularly for preaching and worship, observes the biblical sacraments of baptism and communion, are unified by the Spirit, and scattered to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission as missionaries to the world for God's glory and the church's joy. We believe. We believe. We believe. Nós acreditamos. We believe. We believe. We believe. Morning. That was a great good morning. Thank you for that. Um, so the song We Believe, um, just powerful, isn't it? And in each of those statements is a beautiful foundation to our faith in Jesus Christ. It's what we believe. And when we sing those and we're united singing those together as people, one person, is, it's beautiful and it gives so much glory um, to God. But we know that when we're singing those statements, that there is only one name above all names. There is one king above all kings, and that's Jesus Christ. And we know that God longs for his church. In fact, he commands his church, his people, to be one and united so that we can love lavishly to our neighbors and our enemies. But let's be real. There's a lot of us right now sitting in these seats who are asking the questions, the hard questions. This world is crazy. There's so much chaos going on in the world right now. There's so much division going on right now. Where is God? How can God fix this? You're asking questions like, God, do you see me? God, do you even hear me? Jesus, could you tell me what the problem is with the world and all the people in it? Because I've been hearing stories about the end of the world, but I'm in love with a girl, don't want to leave her. And the television screen such hideous things they're talking about the war on the radio 
They say it's all gonna blow And we'll all be left alone No, we'll be dead and we won't know what hit us Jesus, Jesus Jesus, Jesus, if you're up there, won't you hear me? Cause I've been wondering if you're listening for quite a while And Jesus, Jesus, it's a pretty place we live in And I know we messed it up, please be kind Don't let us go out like the dinosaurs Or blown to bits in a third world war there are a hundred different things I like to do I'd like to climb to the top of the Eiffel Tower Look up at the ground at a meteor shower And maybe even raise a family Jesus, Jesus, there are those who say they love you They have treated me so mean and I know you said forgive them for they know not what they do but I'm pretty sure they do when I think about you and if all the heathens burn in hell do all their children burn as well what about the Muslims and their gays and unwed mothers what about me and all my friends? Are we all sinners cause we sin? Does it even matter in the end if we're unhappy? Jesus, Jesus, I'm still looking for the answers Though I know that I won't find them here Jesus, Jesus, could you call me if you have the time Maybe we could grab a drink and work this out And maybe then I'll understand Maybe then I'll understand Maybe then I'll understand you Interesting. You stop and you lean into the words. Jesus, Jesus. There's so many things in this world, we stop and we look for a moment. The political landscape feels like it's more polarized than it ever has been, though I'm sure that's been the perspective of people through many generations. I stop and I look around and I just consider when people look at each other and they see one another as better than one another. There's divide between races, divide between socioeconomic classes. The divide, the divide, the divide continues to happen. And we eventually do ask the question, like, Jesus, like, what is the deal? And it's interesting that this is not just a problem that we incur as society or we incur right now in our generation. This has been something that's been going on for a long time. It's the reason that Jesus came. And I wanted to start off today, this is the really end of our series, this idea of being united. It sounds great in theory, very hard in practice to be, have unity, Right? And so, but it's beautiful to stop as we look at Scripture and we think about, Jesus, what did you think about unity? And the Apostle Paul brings us to a point. He's writing a letter to the church of Coloss. And I want to read this before we pray and start our day. That he reminds us of the supremacy of God. That God's the ultimate uniter. That nobody is greater than him in this. And it reads this. 
It says, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus. And for him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile, to bring back together, to unite, if you would, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Father, we ask, just as we finalize this series, this idea of unity, God, something that you desired, because when you see humanity, you just don't see people groups and races. Jesus, you see your children. And God, like a good father, you want them united. You, you desire for us to see one another through your eyes, the eyes of love. And so help us today as we navigate through, in your mighty name we ask. Amen. Uh, what a beautiful way to open up the day. And Davey, gosh, the song, the words in the song were so powerful. Somebody to ask because we've all been there. We've all asked these questions. We've all said these things. And it's interesting as we point our way to Jesus today, of all the different things that we pull from Scripture, I just want to give you a little list of some different sayings, things that we have said that actually are extrapolated that come out of Scripture. A wolf in sheep's clothing, the writing is on the wall, is white as snow, turn the other cheek, Right, we talked about that last week. To wash one's hands of something, to weigh something in the balance, a doubting Thomas, the straight and narrow, or even the idea of a scapegoat. All these find their origin in Scripture, every one of them. So interesting. But of all these different statements and these sayings, one of the most famous ones, would you guess? We talked about earlier in the greeting video, if you're paying attention, this is like trivia right now. Where are you listening? Where are you watching? The Good Samaritan. Right, the Good Samaritan, and we hear this all the time, if somebody was a Good Samaritan, somebody did a good deed, somebody helped somebody out, somebody was in need, and somebody showed up, and somebody met that need, and we call them a Good Samaritan, and we love these stories. Nobody is ever like, that guy's a jerk, that guy really is a stinking Good Samaritan. You'd be like, what? You know, that doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all. A good, we love the Good Samaritans, we love these stories. We can't help it, no matter who they are, what they are when they do something good like that. And it was interesting this past week, I came out of Leo's Coney, and uh, I, I've been to Leo's Coney like all week. I feel like when I'm in Leo's Coney for two or three times, I come out and I smell like the grease that, that's been baked in there, right? That's kind of gross now that I think about it. But I come out and I get in my Jeep Liberty, and it's dead as a doornail, won't start. And so the guy that I was eating lunch with, I invited him back to help me start my car, uh, the cables we had wouldn't work, so I called another friend of mine real quick. He was right in the area, and he came by, Ryan Olette, and it was so cool. I a, <clears throat> grabbed a picture of us. He started the car. He got a jump for me. He had to go underneath my car, and he had to, like, hit on the starter and knock rust out of the way, and the starter finally, like, engaged. But if you zoom in on that picture, probably, like, that's my son's ukulele. I didn't have a hood prop. <laughs> I have a hood prop. So I borrowed the ukulele, and I, I, I put it in there. And use that. But he was like my good Samaritan. So I just did a little Facebook post. I'm like, good Samaritan, Ryan Olet came to the rescue. And people were like pouring out and loved it. And that's who Ryan is. Ryan really is a good Samaritan. He would show up anywhere, anytime for anyone at all. And do anything that you would need to help out. It's just part of his heart. It's how God's wired him. But it's amazing to think, why do we love these stories so much? And that's where we're going today, if you haven't guessed. As we try to come to a finale. We try to understand the heart of God around this idea of being united. Because a lot of people have emailed and called and they're like, man, we love this idea of being united, but you can't do it. You're not going to bring Trump and Biden supporters together. You're not going to bring Black Lives Matters and All Lives Matters together. You're not just give up. A lot of people say just give up. Give up on the idea. It's not going to happen. But I love this. If it was up to me, man, I love the idea of being united, but I don't have the power to do that. Jesus comes to this world and he says, I'm going to reconcile this world. Paul is saying that in Colossians. He's going to reconcile the world. And he's going to do it through death on a cross. He's going to humble himself that we might be elevated. And in the middle of it, in the end of his work, he doesn't want to see his family torn apart. And so as we look today to the Good Samaritan story, it's a beautiful moment. And we're going to go from the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to look at the story. And what's so amazing about Jesus, he was a master storyteller. And within these stories, 
you would see characters and you would almost see yourself. You would see people that had problems, people in positions of power, people that were desperate, people that were asking about eternity, people that were curious about their plight, people that needed help, people that were hurt, people that were lonely. He would capture the human soul and within his stories he'd provide truth and power. And he does so no different in this story here. And it comes up in his disciples, if you read through Luke 9 and and chapter 10, Jesus is amassing his following. He's bringing his 12 disciples in Luke chapter 9. Then he gathers 72 together. Then there's crowds coming, and he's on the forefront of his ministry, and people are challenging him, even now, even like people calling me and saying, the idea of being united sounds really good, but come on, Jeremiah, give me a break, right? Well, people are no different than Jesus then. They're like, this is really great. You might be the Messiah, I don't know, but you're never going to unite Jews and Gentiles. You're never going to bring together Samaritans and Jews. You're never going to figure this out with the Roman. It's never going to work. Like, they're pushing against it. But Jesus always would be countercultural. He would always push against the systems that were in place. And he would elevate a truth that would resonate so strongly in the hearts of his listeners that as they lean in, they couldn't help but accept the reality, maybe he's right. And maybe there's truth to what he's saying. And that's what we're going for today. We're going to lean in and say, God, is there truth in what you're saying? So today in person and online, I want us to really immerse ourselves in the story if we could. And it opens up this way. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you have to understand, rabbinical things would go like this. Teacher, I, there's an expert in the law, and he's asking, he's an, he's an attorney, he's a lawyer, he's, a, he's a, probably a student of a rabbi, and he's identifying Jesus as a teacher. And they would ask questions, but Jesus would tell stories, and we're going to get to that story pretty soon. But they would ask questions back and forth. They would, they would ask a question, and they would ask a question back, back and forth. Like This is how they would dialogue. And Jesus would respond, because he's asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response is, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And so the expert responded, and he said, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replies, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied to this, do this and you will live. He goes, you will find eternal life if you live this way. You'll find it here, and you'll find it in the hereafter. He goes, you'll find it that way. What's so interesting about this is that this expert in the law, they had Jews at the time had 613 different laws they would go through. They did. They had 365 uh, laws that you're supposed to not do, like don't do this, and 248 that you're supposed to do. And, and, And that's how it would go. And he was trying to trip up Jesus. He's like, let's see if Jesus can respond to this and answer this. What's so interesting, the Jews continued to compile and compile hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these laws. And if we get like that, if we live by the letter of the law, or we're perfectionist, or we're performance-based, or like, you know, you, you did good, but you screwed up here kind of thing, right? Like, that's what the attorney is trying to do to Jesus in this moment. And if we look on the periphery, we miss the center of Jesus' teaching. Like, if we look on the fringe of all the stuff that Jesus did, we miss what was central. What was central was what was being talked about right there. I want to go back and kind of examine that verse a little bit. It's actually taken from, it says, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Well, that's not something that the attorney just came up with. That's something that Jewish customs had been practicing for for generations. We find it actually in the book of Deuteronomy. It says here, it says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. They would recite this twice a day. Some of them had, would have a, a philatrices, which would be like this black box they would keep here in their head or in their chest and would have that scripture in it, and they would recite it in the morning. They'd recite it in the evening. I'm like, this was of the greatest commands. But it's interesting because Jesus is pulling this other part together too because the attorney responded and said, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you're right. If you do this, you'll live. You will have life. You'll have this eternal life that you're, you're desiring if you do this. And that comes from Leviticus. I want to show you, and there's a reason I want to build this all in together. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people. Now, think about this. Any of your people. I want to come back to that phrase, okay? But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So Jesus is pulling these two great commandments. What? Love God. Love what? Love others. Love God and love others. And he says, you will have life. And so, like, 
That's beautiful. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, he's saying, look, you can hang all the commandments. And when he says that, we sometimes think of these 10 commandments, but the experts in the Jewish customs would know he's talking about 613. He's saying you can forget about all that stuff if you can figure out how to love God and love others. And Jesus is equating, he's tying this together. He's saying, it's awesome that you want to love, it's, it's amazing that you're trying to keep 613 laws, good for you, I could never do that, I don't know about you, I could never possibly do that, right? And that's great if you want to do that, but if you can love God, you can't just love God, you got to be willing to love others. This is why people hate the church, this is why people call people that go to church hypocrites, or this is why they call people that are Christians hypocrites, or it's ironic that you say you love God, but you what? Dislike your neighbor, you don't like anybody else, and and it's crazy because it's like God's really getting to this equation saying, if you want to love me, you've got to love my kids, right? Uh, you have to. I mean, let me, let me tell you, a, a quick way to lose a friend real quick is insult their child. I mean, even when kids are born, have you ever seen people are showing baby photos and they're like, hey man, my kid was just born, it's amazing, and they show a picture of them, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> aren't they beautiful? Phew, I'm speechless. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't have to say in that moment, yes, they're they're amazing. <laughs> you know, like I'm hoping they morph. I mean, grow into a, a beautiful child or something. I, I'm kidding. I'm going to take some major heat here. I have not looked at anybody's baby photos recently, but, but I thought that too. When my kids came out, I'm like, I was like, oh my gosh, are they going to have a cone head forever? You know what I mean? Like it was, it was crazy. I know I'm not winning anybody over that's pregnant or just recently had a kid. Your kids are beautiful. I promise you. Okay. But Jesus is saying, you can't love me and not love others. You can't love me, the Father, and not give a rip about my kids. And the attorney has this major moment. This is where the twist and the plot and the story is going to expand. And I want to really like weave one another together in this story. It's so beautiful. But he wanted to justify himself. Have you ever been with those people? They just want to argue. They want to debate. They want to get the last word. They want to be right. They want to shove those people <laughs> This is that person, and he's pushing back on Jesus. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? At this point, the attorney asked a question. Jesus asked a question. Two of them, right? Like, well, what is the law, and how do you interpret it? And then he responds again with a question. He says, who is my neighbor? And this is how they're reasoning together. Jesus in Scripture says, come let us reason together. He's referring to this rabbinical dialogue, how they do this. They're trying to get to the meaning and to the depth. They're trying to extrapolate truth. That's really, even though the attorney doesn't realize that he's trying to prove Jesus wrong, Jesus is bringing him and inviting him on this journey, saying, I know you were here to trip me up and to trap me, but I'm here to bring you truth and to set you free. That's what's always beautiful about Jesus, whether it be his followers or his enemies, those that didn't know him and those that despised him. He was consistently trying to unite people around truth of who he was. In a reply, he tells a story. Now listen, he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Everybody in the audience at this moment would have leaned into Jesus because they would have thought Jerusalem, they knew that was high up and elevated where somebody would have went, a Jewish man, a Jewish family, to worship, to give. It's like coming here like today on Sunday, right? Would have gone there. Jericho would have been almost half a mile below from this beautiful tropical environment almost up here that was at that time around Jerusalem to this dry, arid place, this narrow, tiny road where robbers would have been, this 18-mile journey that they would have been going down. People would have known and said, yes, I know, I knew somebody that got robbed, or I know that's dangerous, and you should never walk alone. They would have thought, Jesus, why is this man in the story by himself? He should have been with his family and his servants. He should have been with his friends. Like, you would never go down to eight mile in the middle of, like, three in the morning. You would never do that. Like, they're thinking, leaning in. And then he introduces, he says, to this man that's been beaten, half dead, robbed. And they're visualizing this person. His clothes have been taken. He's bloodied. He's probably unconscious. He's sitting there. It says a priest happened to go down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Can you imagine if you're beaten and you're hurt and I see you and I walk by? He says, so too a Levite. And when he came to the place and saw him and passed by the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, 
and brought him to an end and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii. This is two days' wages. Like, just do the math. What is two days' wages for you right now? That he gave two days' wages to the innkeeper. He says, look after him. And he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Now, in this moment, everybody is thinking, this is crazy. This is, they're, 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 they can't believe this. Number one, the priest. The priest should have, in our opinion, right, the priest should have stopped and served this man. Can you imagine, seriously, if you caught me or one of our staff that we saw somebody hurt, like at Kroger gas station, and there was an old lady that tire was flat, and we saw it. You see, you saw us from a distance, and we saw this older lady and her tires flat, and we just blow her off, and we go away and move on with her way. You see, everything Jeremiah has talked about, there's no compassion in that. There's no truth in that. He's not trying to help anybody or serve anybody, or even the Levite. Like, he was the associate pastor. He was like the assistant to the priest. Like, why didn't he do anything? They, and, and this is like a narrow road. Like, they just didn't, like, walk to the other side of this big two-lane road or three-lane road with a medium in between. This was a narrow pathway, sometimes only where a single person could get through a time. They may have had to have stepped over this individual to get away from him. These are people that are in society, in Jewish custom, these are the people that were interfacing with God on behalf of the people. These are people that are supposed to love God and love what? Others. And here's the others, right? And, and, and he's, he's there, and he's a Jewish man. He's one of them, and he's beaten, and he's half dead, and he's naked, and he's hurt, and he's alone, and nobody's there for him. And the people that are supposed to love him the most, Jesus is saying, they just blow him off and walk by. Like, this is crazy. But the beginning of the song, Jesus, Jesus, the world looks to the church, and often we get seen as this priest and this Levite. They're saying, you want to talk about unity, and you want to talk about peace, and you want to talk about grace, but come on. Like, I'm hurting. I'm broken. Things are falling apart, and where are you? I mean, Marie and I were on, just a week ago on Monday, on a, on a foster care call, a Zoom call for a court case, and when we hung up, our, our eyes welled up with water because we were like firsthand, front row, looking at the brokenness and devastation that the enemy has put inside of families. He's ripping them apart. And for us to see it and move away and have no compassion, we would have been like this priest and this Levite. But the Samaritan in the story, Jesus introduces this Samaritan, and he always does things that are countercultural. He does things that are, they, they push against the paradigm of the day. And I love that because he's trying to get out the societal norms, the systems that are in place. Are you saying the systems we have now in place are bad, Jeremiah? I'm not even worried about those. I'm focusing on the truth, what Jesus is trying to do in this moment too. He brings in and introduces a Samaritan. Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They were considered what was called a half-breed because they had intermarried with Gentiles. They were, they were looked on as less than and as no good. And the hated person of the day, culturally to the Jews, were the Samaritans. But the hero of the story is who? The Samaritan. People are furious with Jesus at this point. Jesus is just like this master storyteller, this master bringer of truth. He is the Messiah. And he is standing in the midst of humanity's biggest issues, problems from racism, from socioeconomic disparity, from hate, from evil, from a lack of compassion. He's stepping in the gap in this moment. And he's bringing who they hate to be the hero of the story. And I love this, the Samaritan walks by. Can you imagine if somebody that hated you, was disgusted with you, that looked down on you, that just thought to you all the time, they're like, okay, I mean, just stop for a moment with me and think, who is it in your life that you would love to punch? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Who, <laughs> who is in your life? Everybody just thought about it. Somebody, God forgive us, we're going to pray real quick in the middle of this message. Who is it you would want to shove or you just would want to just, just shake? You know what I mean? Like they've been mean to you and they've been hurtful to you. They've bullied you. They were rude to you. They were disenfranchising to you. The Samaritan felt this way. If anything, he probably would have been justified to like just spit on this guy because this guy probably treated him horrifically, looked down on him, was racist to him, pushed him to the side, but he's moved with compassion. He's moved with empathy, something we lose sight of in our society. We get so caught in who are you supporting? Who are you voting for? What side, what ideology do you adopt, do you live by? And, we, and these are not bad things, but they miss the central thing that Jesus is trying to get at. He's saying, you're saying you love me, but you can't love one another. 
It's like impossible for you all. He says, don't you get it? If you love God and love others, that's when you experience the kingdom of God in your life. That's when you experience something beautiful. And the Samaritan understands and moved with compassion in this moment. He just moved. I can remember growing up with a young man named Paul Chafee. And my parents did not like him because I got in trouble with him. And I was forbid to even go near him anymore after eighth grade. I wasn't allowed to be by him. I couldn't see him. I couldn't talk to him. My parents were mad at him. They would badmouth him. They were aggravated at him. They were like, I don't want you near him or his family. And, and while it wasn't the same as the Jews and the Samaritans, it felt like there was this divide. Well, what summer between eighth and ninth grade, Paul had lost his life, tragically. And I remember going to the funeral. We went to the funeral because we went to the same church. This is usually how it works within our own communities. We, we, we're against each other. This is not united. And we go to this, and Paul Sr. walked up to the coffin. And I'll never forget, it was so solemn. And I saw my dad begin to cry. Because Paul leaned over and he, he kissed his son. He was like a father who loved his child. My dad began to weep. And the differences we had in our families, they seemed to be trivial. They seemed like they didn't even matter anymore. What mattered was this moment of empathy and compassion to see each other in our pains and our hurts. And the Samaritan is doing that. Jesus is saying, do you see the differences that you have? They don't matter. The divine is what matters. The divine is the fact that if you're saying you love me, that's beautiful, but you have to love one another the way, and he's saying the Samaritan is. Jesus brings in Matthew. He brings us all because this expert of the law, why do they have 613 laws? They're striving so badly to commune with God. They want to know something spiritual. We all do. We all dream and we all think. We say, is there an afterlife? Is there a purpose to this world? Is there something more here? Or maybe it's a magical moment that we have as we see the Grand Canyon for the first time or we watch like a, like a sunset in the Florida coast. Doesn't that sound beautiful right now on a cold day? Right? Like this moment we see God's creation and we're moved in not our heart but our soul. Like there's something about it. And Jesus addresses this. He says, he's talking about if you want the divine, he goes, here's how it happens. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. You visited me when I was in prison and nobody would visit me. And the people respond to Jesus and they say, who, who did this? We never knew you were sick. We never knew you were naked. We never knew you needed clothes. We never knew you were in prison, Jesus. And they're saying, when did we do this? And Jesus says, here, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. Jesus is getting this point across in the story of the Good Samaritan through the Samaritan. When we have empathy, when we do to the least of these, when we clothe the naked, when we visit those that are imprisoned, when we love on those, when we care for those, when we're, we're moved with empathy in that way, when we take action, our love is like devoid without action, don't you think? To say I love you is a beautiful statement. To love you is a beautiful thing to do. Do you see? There's a difference. Jesus is getting in that. He's like, you've got to be moved from compassion to the point of passion where you take action about something. He's like, this is how unity comes about. When we find ourselves united is when we don't walk beyond ourselves and over our top one another, but we look at one another and we're so moved with the pains or the hurts or the plights that one another face that we can't help but do something about it. A lot of people say, well, that's doing the right thing. That's being a good what? A Samaritan in that moment. And I stop and I think about this. Like, this is why we do what we do. This is why we give. Even now, like I'll even mention it, like when we take offering right now, uh, this, is why we, this is why we encourage you to be generous. It's not giving to an institution. It's not just giving to a place. It's not giving. It's giving to a movement, a movement that's supposed to be marked by compassion, by empathy, by the teachings of Jesus Christ, by the belief that Jesus Christ is the only way to the living God, right? We do this, and there's different ways that we do this, and I, I know we got that up there, and thank you for those that are generous and help us make this movement possible. Like some of our global partners, as an example, like right now, we've got a global partner in India that there are thousands, tens of thousands of elderly people that have to sleep on the streets every single night. And so we have part of our ministry there is that we go there and we find shelter for them. And we bring them in and we try to help them from, from finding clean clothes and warm clothes and a warm meal to be loved. And in those moments, our heartbeat is that we could be like that good Samaritan, that we could bring the love of Jesus Christ, not just saying we love God, 
Uh, but we don't care about others. But we love God but because, we, when, because we do love you, God, and we know that you loved us. We want to actually love others in that same way. I was so pumped up yesterday, and some of you helped him. Have you seen uh, Nate Hawes, Shelby Nate Hawes, go to our campus, and he's been building desks. It's called Desk by Nate. You can look him up on Facebook. You can do it now if you want to. It's unbelievable. I just want to encourage you about this. He's been so moved. So many students that had to do remote learning that wanted uh, say, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? And they didn't even have a desk and they couldn't afford a desk or even, even could afford a desk. You'd go online and guess what? What were all sold out? Desk. So he started making them. He's already made, and I, I wrote it down here, he's already made 45 of these desks and he's got 340 more on order. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And he's providing desks for free the families that couldn't afford them and otherwise wouldn't have them. And he's being a blessing to them. And it's, it's so unbelievable. And he is like moving the gospel far all over. He's having empathy. It really, he had hard empathy about these young families that didn't have anything. And he's moving with them. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's part of our community. That, and I was texting with him. That's a picture of Jesus Christ. Being moved with empathy and compassion. And I love the story comes back up. See, the Samaritan in the story is doing this in this moment. But this next part of the parable the next question, in a way, is the greatest question of all. Jesus asks, he says, which of these three do you think was the neighbor? And a man who fell into the hands of the robbers. Now, all of us feel like when the expert answers, this would have been the right answer, because we all feel this way. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him. He says, go and do likewise then. The expert responds in this way, but here's what's so interesting. Jesus is asking, he says, who did the right thing? Because you're an expert in the law. You're a perfectionist. You're a rule follower. Like you're, you're trying to entrap me in this moment. And I've revealed to you this powerful truth. Jesus is really saying in the story, he says, so who did the right thing? And the expert, in our opinion, I mean, I don't know if anybody disagree. The Samaritan did. He did the right thing by stopping and helping. The priest did not. The Levite did not. But here's what's so interesting. The expert in the law knows that if the priest or the Levite would have stopped, they would have been unclean in their travels to or from, right, to Jerusalem to actually worship and do that. That would have been unclean. Look even what it says in Leviticus. The law that they were trying to follow would have forbid them. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, none shall defile for the dead among these people, nor shall any go near a dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother. This would have been wrong. The expert of the law knows this. Like, but the rules said, but the rules say, but our customs say, but our policy is, right? And I, I mean, don't you love it when a store says, why don't we actually love people over policy? Why don't we just kill the custom if it's actually hurting the people? If the rule is punishing people and we can't even love or care for somebody, why are we following it? The expert of the law is having this moment. He's saying, I can't help but be moved with compassion, Jesus. You're right. Like, I know that it should have been the priest and it should have been the Levite that actually did the right thing, but I can't say it. The Samaritan, the hated cultural enemy of mine, became the hero of the story, now the hero of my heart. Like, he was moved. This wasn't like this pompous, self-righteous expert of the law moment. His heart has changed. It is with sadness and humility and empathy now. The Samaritan. The Samaritan is the one that did the right thing, Jesus. And he was probably moved, maybe even speechless after that moment. Jesus, you see, is introducing something not just to this moment, but to all of us. As the followers of Jesus, we're called to be the same thing, to become unclean for our neighbors. The Samaritan probably got messy when he did that. He probably took off his cloak and covered the man. He put him on his donkey. He, it, it was going to do this. It was going to cost him money to show God's radical love and grace and even mercy Mercy, the persecuted, racially profiled against Samaritan, considered a half-breed, no good, less than, get out of our space, don't worship where we are. The Samaritans even had a different place where they would worship. The Jews pushing against him, he's saying, come on now, right? Like that person did that. You know what's beautiful about this word mercy? It means haste, haste in this moment. This word, see, what is that? It actually means womb. What happens in a womb? In a womb, there is nurturing, there is safety, there is nutrients, there is protection. As a church, 
that we're called to be this. We're called to provide this as a church, this womb of mercy. We're supposed to be a place where people that are confused can come and find clarity. People that have been left out can come on the inside and feel like they're, they're not left out. They weren't forgotten about. They were loved and cared for. People that are, that are hurt feel like they can find no forgiveness can come hear about a Jesus and experience his people and his followers of Jesus that they experience forgiveness in their own life. I'm like, this is what we're supposed to do. It was beautiful on this foster care call that we're on, and this is a credit to my wife and not me, that the social worker was asked, like, how is it? How is the child doing? And the, there's attorneys and everything involved in the Zoom call, and the social worker spoke up and said, Mrs. Roy's done a phenomenal job. She's loved this child so well that, that she's made this, and she noted this, she's made this beautiful room for her, and Maria did. Maria repainted the room. We got a different rug in there. We got this, like, chic little rug in there for this little girl. I mean, she's got this beautiful crib. She's got these beautiful statements. She's got statements that say you are loved and you belong here. <laughs> she's a good woman. And she, she does this in this moment. And she's acting as this good Samaritan. And we're called to be this as the church. Jesus says again in Matthew, he says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, he's saying, I know you've been following your rules. But I'm going to tell you something different. And he, and, and he meant what he said because he actually showed, he backed up. He went to the cross at the beginning as we read from the letter of Colossians that Jesus says that he reconciled, he brought peace to the world through the cross. He's already taken the pain and the punishment. He's done this for us. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Be the good Samaritan. Can you imagine as we look to the forefront of the future, as the Lord navigates us through this pandemic, as we come on the other end, as we want to be a place, like I wanted to see us grow, and I want to see us go, and I want to see us move, and I want to see us do things that we could never have possibly done outside of the power of Jesus. And for people to say, like that's a good Samaritan church, those people are unbelievable. Those people cross the street, they pick up the wounded, they take them to the hospital, they heal them, they help them. Don't you want to be marked as that? Don't you want to be like the expert in the law and you say the right answer is the good Samaritan. The right way to live is the good Samaritan. Jesus, you're right. Jesus, I can't believe this. Like he's revealing this. If we want to be a united family, a united marriage, united culture, united community, like if we actually want to be the United States, right, then it starts here and it looks to the teachings of Jesus that we don't look at one another better than one another, but we look at each other with empathy and we look at each other with love and kindness that's so hard to do yeah but it's the right thing to do and like the attorney who had every reason to dispute jesus was moved in his soul what is it that moves you in your soul that causes you to feel this way he had an encounter with jesus and it changed him the expert of the law the leader of that community the most wise person they had in the jewish community they bring forward and he comes encountered with Jesus, and Jesus radically changes, not his way of thinking, but his way of his heart, the way it felt first, and the way of his thinking. If you've not had like an encounter with Jesus, it's hard to do that. See, the scripture says that we love God because he loved us first. We do things, action steps like this, like we, God's inviting us to choose empathy over anger, to cross the street, this might be crossing a cubicle or crossing the street in your neighborhood or crossing an aisle in Kroger and talking to somebody. I, whatever God nudges you to do, like don't push it back, but take action like the Samaritan. Trying to say yes, where most often we'd normally say no. We'd, we'd normally go, no, no, that doesn't fit my no. That is. What if we said yes to those moments? Making the outsider the insider. When you have an encounter with Jesus like the expert of the law does, it changes the way you see things. I stop and I think for me, when I was 11 years old, my mom had this catastrophic moment and the ambulance came and they had to take her away and, and, and my sister, my family member picked my sister and, and the fire trucks were there and it was, it was chaos. And I can remember sitting in the kitchen and everybody had left and I don't know how it happened, it was probably in the chaos and the busyness of everything and I was left there. And the fire trucks pulled back in. The fire truck pulled all the way back in our driveway and came in. A guy named Mark Treger came back in. And he came in and he kind of stooped down. He said, you probably thought we forgot you, didn't you? And he smiled at me. He said, I didn't forget you. And he held out his hand. And he picked me up and he put me in his fire truck and we went to the hospital. 
And I felt like in that moment as I looked back on it, that God was saying, I've never forgotten you. I will never forsake you. I'll never leave you, even to the ends of the earth. When we encounter Jesus in that way, it moves us. But it moves us to do what Mark does. It moves us to see other people and say, you thought you were forgotten about. But you really weren't. God did not forget about you. He sent me here to love you. I mean, that's powerful. We're always looking for the miraculous. The miraculous always happens through mankind. That's why God came in the form of man. God ministers and reconciles through us, through his church. We're just people broken and messed up, but he, he moves through us. If we want to find a united family and community and nation, we find ourselves being like the Good Samaritan. Jesus, I pray and I ask that you, before you can even heal our land, God, you have to heal our heart. We have sometimes a heart like the expert in the law, and we're bitter and we're judgmental, and we look at people with no empathy. But Jesus, when you come into our heart, you cause us to find healing and love, and you cause us to be able to see people with that same desire to, that they could find healing, that they could find love. Lord, let us be a community that will cross the street, that will love those that have been forgotten and pushed over and beaten and hurt. Lord, let us be that kind of church. Heal us, Father. Heal our hearts and heal our land. Amen. together.
sing he's worthy he's worthy of every song we could ever sing he's worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe he's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
get to sing that together as one church, amen. It's so powerful when we come united in these moments where nothing else matters but being one in Jesus Christ. So let's sing this out one more time. I will build. And I want you to think about what the King of Kings, how powerfully he could move through your church that's united as we reach to love and serve a divided world. Come on, we sing. And I will build. resonate those words. There's nobody I know outside of Jesus that we could put our, our faith in. I pray you have a beautiful Sunday. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing to you, please call us, email us, message us at all. We're excited about the month of November. We've got uh, how to take a hit and uh, keep moving forward on the way Jesus lived. And I've got my friend Chris Swanson. He's a Genesee County Sheriff. He's coming in to speak from the perspective of the believer and somebody that's taking major hits. Uh, Steve Anders will be in, and we're trying to get we're trying to get Mark Nelson too, his dad to come back and speak. So we're excited about November and a lot of good things. We're working hard right now to open up our K Kids programming middle of November, and so a lot of beautiful things happening. So be praying with us, be excited about what God has before us. So love you, take care.